Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, here with Josh and Paul and a few friends who I'll introduce uh, in a minute who are going to help uh, us better understand how the ARP expanded access to the ACA. I know. What the heck does that mean? That means how the money we're getting from Joe Biden and the federal government's going to exp greatest expansion of Obamacare since Obama and what that means for making health care more accessible for everybody. And I think over this last year plus of COVID, we realize how important that is. First off, let me give you some good news on our COVID daily summary. Uh, 486 COVID cases. That is the lowest number we've had in six months. As you know, I'm not a day trader, but this two-week trend, this four-week trend really means a lot. And over the last uh, couple of weeks, it's down 50%. So I like to think that this is a trend that's going to be with us for a long time. Uh, hospitalizations continue to uh, trend down slightly in this case. Fatalities uh, plus four, making some progress. And again, the reason is the vaccines are working. Uh, JJ Clinics, uh, we got them going again. We did about a thousand doses. A pretty good demand for JJ. All colleges have completed their first dose. Something I worked on with uh, all of our other governors because there'll be millions of college kids dispersing over the region and over the country. And um, we wanted, while they were still in one place, at least get them uh, their first shot. We didn't have J&J &J at the time, so at least they got their Pfizer or Moderna. Uh, is the appetite for vaccinations trends down a little bit, we'll talk about. We're really working hard to bring the mobile vans to large events. Maybe they're going to be uh, parades coming up, uh, uh, fairs and the such large employer clinics doing everything we can to uh, get the vaccine to you. Uh, there are about 100 clinics plus offering walk-up appointments. Between you and me, I think most places now uh, allow walk-up. So uh, take advantage of that while you can, because um, uh, Max and I were there in um, East Windsor today, a big parking lot there in terms of incentives. You could pick up food if you were food insecure, and you could get vaccinated. Um, there was demand, but uh, demand was down. And uh, we're doing everything we can to make the, the last of our uh, folks, 34% uh, who aren't vaccinated, hope they get vaccinated and vaccinated soon. You know, um, thankfully, demand for food is down a little bit as well. Demand for vaccinations is probably down about 50% over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, Josh tells me our providers are ordering about 50% less. So there's extra capacity out there. Um, on a personal note, rather than have that sit on a shelf, I was, I was really pleased that a lot of that's going to places that are still being hit incredibly hard, like India. And it just, you see the devastation in places like India and Brazil, and it reminds you uh, how important it is that we keep each other safe by wearing the mask indoors and vaccinations. All right, here's the vaccination rates by age. I gave you this uh, probably a couple weeks ago. Here's what you ought to see for the 65 and above group, you know, that, that's well over 80 percent vaccinated. You see that trended up pretty well until they got close to 80 percent, and then it started flattening out a little bit. You'll see at the younger age groups, uh, 45 to 54, it started trending down or flattening at about 60 percent. And for the youngest age group, 16 to 44, that's the blue line at the bottom there, uh, it's beginning to flatten out at, um, you know, 45 percent. So we've got to be extra aggressive in terms of those incentives and making sure um, everybody gets vaccinated. Uh, we've said that at length. I mean, I told you about uh, what we did, in, in, for example, in Middletown. They're the mobile van. They're handing out um, uh, discount cards for the local stop and shop. Uh, I can tell you it's CVS is offering, selected CVSs are offering a discount cards if you go in there and get your vaccination as well. You heard about our Drinks on Us um, program, which is going to start in um, a little under three weeks. Still a chance to get your vaccine. We had uh, now over 160 restaurants have signed on. Almost 200,000 people have gone to the website. So I think we're doing everything we can to generate um, all the incentives you need to make sure you get vaccinated. That plus moral suasion. And because people are getting vaccinated, um, we are getting back to um, a new normal, which is really good to see. Starting the day after tomorrow, Saturday, May 1st, um, I think this picture sort of says it all. Um, the business curfew, we were at 11 o'clock, now we're at 12 o'clock uh, a.m. 
Uh, that means a lot. That means for a lot of restaurants, they can get a second seating. Um, that's uh, really going to be good for the restaurants and lift employees. Um, outdoor restrictions will be lifted. Uh, so let me tell you what that means. That means like this group you see in the picture, you're uh, outside, you're with friends or you're vaccinated and you know the group you're with, um, no need to wear the mask. If you're in a more crowded area outside, you're maybe with folks you don't know, um, caution would indicate continue to wear the mask. But right now, that's the guidance, and uh, I think that's a, a nice, refreshing uh, step. No table size limits. Remember, we were limited to eight because we wanted to keep the cohort smaller. That's lifted as of Saturday. And uh, for those of you who got um, tired of always having to order a meal while you got uh, your drink, um, you know, starting on Saturday, you can get um, – a beer, a glass of wine, or a Coca-Cola, um, and you don't have to order a meal with it. So those are all changes happening the day after tomorrow, which are uh, due to the good work of each and every one of you that have uh, brought our infection rate to the lowest rate it's been in six months. That takes us back to health care and how um, important we realize that everybody has access to health care We've realized that more than ever. It's not just a basic right for people. It not only keeps you safe, but it keeps everybody around you safe. And uh, first and foremost, what are we as a state doing to make things more affordable? And uh, what's uh, going on uh, in terms of the American Rescue Plan? As you know, Connecticut, we implemented cost and quality benchmarks, transparency, see who's raising rates, uh, why they're raising rates, who's raising rates more. Vicki Veltri's taking the lead on that. We followed what was going on in Massachusetts. That's serving to depress increases in rates. We expanded telehealth. We had to do that in the middle of COVID when we were stay safe, stay at home. And I think that's going to make health care a lot more accessible to people at less cost. This says we reduced premium increases for 2021. Let me be more aggressive on that. It was the lowest increase in health care premium rates uh, in uh in recent past, in decades, it's extraordinary. Um, you know, not because we did anything particular, but because there were so many fewer elective surgeries that brought down the health cost of health care, and that's so important. That's where my um, our other priorities are to bring down the cost of health care to each and every one of you by bringing down the underlying costs. Uh, we did sign uh, the best uh, paid family and medical leave. I think we realized what that means during COVID where we want to make sure that you had no reason to say, oh, I don't want to get tested because then I may have to quarantine and I'll lose my job. Or I'm going to go to work even though I feel like I have a you know, bad case of the flu because I don't want to lose my job. You know, that would have been incredibly dangerous if the federal government had it stepped up uh, during the COVID crisis. And we're, that's going to be permanent here in Connecticut. And we'll see whether that is going to be permanent in Washington, D.C., we waived out-of-pocket costs for people who purchased coverage on their own, and um, I wanted to make sure there were no impediments to you um, uh, uh, being able to get vaccinated, for you to be able to get that coverage. What we're doing now in our current um, legislative session to hold down the underlying costs of health care, which is the best way to continue to make health care affordable to everybody, is one, we're doing this in association with the Massachusetts, we're limiting uh, the increase in drug pricing, uh, you know, once you've got your um, investment uh, paid off. So that's six, seven, eight, those generic drugs, sometimes they're going up quite a bit. We're capping that at in, in inflation plus. I think that's going to make a real long-term difference in holding down the high price of uh, health care premiums for you. And secondly, um, the federal government had a tax on a health insurance um, they got rid of uh, the tax. We're getting rid of 85% of the tax that uh, health insurance um, companies were paying. But with the other 15% of that, we're going to uh, greatly reduce the premiums and out-of-pocket costs and co-pays that go along with your uh, health insurance. You know, in many cases, uh, you can afford the premium, but you still can't afford health care because of those co-pays. So, Connecticut is going to hit that hard. We're bringing down the premiums, we're bringing down the underlying costs, and we're bringing down the, um, the premiums and co-pays that you have. <clears throat> Making health care more affordable. Um, the American Rescue Plan lowers premiums for people who purchase coverage on their own. 
over half of the customers uh, will pay nothing, um, or at max uh, $16 a month. It's going to be an enormous reduction in what's going on. Individuals making up to $19,000 um, and families making up to $40,000 will pay nothing, zero premium, zero deductible. Earning up to $40,000 a year, zero premium, zero um, deductible. Earning up to $106,000 a year, a family of four earning up to $106,000, your premium is going to go from about $16,000 a year to $9,000 a year. Uh, that's a significant uh, savings. And I, um, what we've got to do is make sure people take advantage of that um, going forward. Look, we've got additional um, options on the um, exchange. Uh, Cigna's got a new program out there for small business. A lot of other small businesses may want to set up a separate account for their employees if they find that the um, exchange is a much more um, affordable option for uh, the smallest employers. Hey, look, um, enough from me. Let me introduce you to uh, Laura Packard. Um, she has been a leader around the country in her not-for-profit in um, explaining the value of this expansion of uh, Obamacare and what it means. And she's going to be able to explain this in a few minutes, uh, the power to you. And then to stick around afterwards, we've got two friends, uh, one of whom you know pretty well is James Michel. He's the president of Access Health. That's our exchange. That's our Obamacare for the state of Connecticut. He'll give you a little more insight into how to make this available to you because May 1, we open up again, so you have this opportunity to reduce your costs. And the Maris Velez. She works with um, James and the rest of the team as a navigator. They'll be here to answer further questions. But with that, Laura, tell me why this is a big deal for people. Uh, thank you for inviting me, Governor. Uh, my name is Laura, and about four years ago, I walked into a doctor's office with a nagging cough and walked out with a stage four cancer diagnosis. The Affordable Care Act saved my life. I never could have afforded the six months of chemotherapy and the month of radiation it took for me to be in remission and be here today, which is why I'm so honored to run a nonprofit, Get America Covered, to spread the word about the Affordable Care Act and how you can benefit. Especially now during a pandemic, it's no time to go without health insurance because even apart from coronaviruses, accidents happen. And now with the American Rescue Plan, which was signed into law a month or so ago, it's cheaper than ever to get a good quality health insurance plan through the Affordable Care Act. Not only do people that have existing plans benefit from uh, cheaper plans now, but if in the past you made a little bit too much money to get help in paying your premiums, uh, the, the American Rescue Plan lifted that cap off so that everybody will benefit and you will not pay more than 8.5% of your income in premiums. And as the governor mentioned, he's working on uh, finding help for uh, high deductibles as well. So if in the past, maybe you couldn't afford health insurance or you weren't sure how to get covered, now is the time. It's more affordable than ever. And you should take a few minutes to go to Access Health CT, check it out, and find out what policies are available to you. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Laura. Really appreciate you being here and able to join us a little bit. And I, uh, you're looking good. I hope you're feeling great and on the mend. Access Health CT, starting up on May 1st, goes through August 15th, an opportunity for real savings. With that, as I told you, um, Josh and Paul are here, as well as James Michelle from Access Health to answer any of your questions, and Damaris, who can help you navigate uh, through any questions you may have. Channel 3, Eyewitness News. Yes, Governor, I have a question about distance learning. Um, districts are not going to be required to have that next year. So what is this going to mean for families who still may be nervous about the virus or for families who do have at-risk children? Well, um, a couple of things on that. Um, I'm really hopeful that our schools are open. You get your kid back to school. Maybe we have a vaccine for uh, kids at that point. Um, we found during the worst of the pandemic, uh, you know, eight, say, eight months ago, our schools were open and open safely. So that's priority number one, two, and three for me. Um, 
you know, if you still do not want to send your kids to school, we'll find what's online and available to help you find alternatives. But I don't think the schools are going to be providing a full-time online alternative. And my final question, you know, today we saw 1.3 million of our residents fully vaccinated. And last week you showed that chart from Israel showing the cases really just plummeting after we hit a similar mark. So is this the trajectory that we're anticipating to see going forward? Are we at that point? I hope so. I sure hope so. Um, I saw what a, a difference it made in Israel. We're, we're at that point right now. But uh, you want to take all risk off the table or most of the risk, get the rest of the people vaccinated. But you can see it's making a difference right now. First, it was on the infection rate, then it was on hospitalizations, and now it's on fatalities. Thank you very much. News 8. Good afternoon, everyone. And Governor, last week, I believe the subject of vaccine uh, waste came up. With supply up and uh, demand down, although you're trying to get the demand up again, is there any worry? Is there any waste going on right now? Is there any way to prevent that? Especially with the, the vaccines, if they're being frozen or if they're in the refrigerators, they come out. Can any of those go back in? What's being done? Uh, or is that a, a, a concern right now? Well, I'll start and then throw it right to uh, Josh. Um, you're right. As we go to smaller and smaller uh, segments, not the big mass vaccination centers, you know, many of the vials have 10 doses in them, so you can't necessarily um, use all 10. So there is a potential for some risk there. But more importantly, our providers are ordering less um, vaccine now, so there won't be any sitting on the shelves, so to speak. And hopefully we make that available to places that really need it. Josh? Yeah, that's exactly right, Governor. And uh, Department of Public Health has made it clear to all of our vaccine providers that, uh, you know, now that we're not no longer in a position of, of scarcity, that they should not let concerns about wastage get in the way of vaccinating every single person we can uh, find uh, who's interested in being vaccinated. So the uh, department has clarified to providers, you know, to ensure that if they need to open another vial to be able to get a smaller number of people vaccinated, that they should go ahead and do that. Thank you. Fox 61. Hi, Governor. Could you talk about what are you hoping to see from May 1st to May 19th? Because we're getting some restrictions rolled back this Saturday, but then all of the restrictions are going to be rolled back on May 19th. So what are we hoping to see between that time frame of about almost three weeks? Uh, that more people are getting vaccinated and more of the youngest people are getting vaccinated. More of the youngest people are getting vaccinated. It gives us a lot more uh, clarity in terms of uh, big venues, um, yard goats games, um, NCAA lacrosse, um, uh, rock concerts. I think that will be clear. My instinct is, as I've said before, that the indoor mask uh, mandate will probably keep going a little bit longer. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor. Catherine Loy with NBC Connecticut. Um, as far as access health goes, um, as I understand that the subsidy lasts for two years. Are there plans to continue this beyond the two years? And, and maybe James Michelle can answer. I mean, what is the demand for this? Is, is this something you're hearing from people that they want to enroll in access health at this point? I can start and then pass it right to James. Uh, the current bill sitting in front of uh, Congress, which they have not yet voted on, would make this permanent. But, James, you know more than that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, <clears throat> we know that right now the estimated is about 200,000 Connecticut residents are without any health insurance. We know that uh, right now um, there are a number of um, Connecticut residents who are underinsured simply because they couldn't afford to buy something um, more with more coverage, so they bought the bronze plan. So uh, the American Rescue Plan will provide additional resources for them to come in and buy up and purchase more. So we are anticipating a great deal of, um, of interest and activity uh, from our current customers as well as uninsured. And we also uh, have roughly have about 10,000 uh, individuals who purchase insurance um, off exchange because they were not, um, as uh, Laura indicated earlier, because they were above the cliff, 
So they didn't qualify for any subsidy. Uh, with the American Rescue Plan, the subsidy down the cliff has been removed. So potentially those 10,000 may come on, come on the exchange now, starting this Saturday, to, um, to take advantage of the additional subsidies that are available to them now, which was not available prior to the American Rescue Plan. And, and a follow-up to that, if I may, do you think this, this opens the door a little bit or, or bolsters the push for a public option? I believe that's a question for the governor. Hmm. Um, look, I think what we're trying to show you is, um, given the great expansion of uh, the ACA, given what we're doing to hold down the underlying costs, um, we're doing everything we can, like the public option wants to do, to make uh, ac- health care more accessible and more affordable. I think we're going in, we have the same goal, and that's, this is how we're trying to do it. And, Governor, if I may just ask, what are your plans as far as these pre- press briefings go after May 20th? That's a good question. I, th- I think I should probably ask you. Um, uh, I think a couple of things. Um, maybe you want to go a little bit longer just because we're still um, in the legislative cycle, a little bit longer to see how the last reopening goes and how uh, vaccinations uh, end up. But uh, I got to say, I think pretty soon we're going to find that we're in a more stable uh, situation where we don't have to do these uh, so regularly. Thank you. News 12, Connecticut. WTIC 1080 News. Hi, uh, James, what's the top benefits to checking back in with Access Healthcare this weekend? Uh, it's, it's all pretty complicated, but what's, what's the number one thing a current or upcoming customer could uh, look forward to if they sign up? Number one, they, could, they can uh, lower the cost of insurance for them. So currently, if the subsidy that they're getting from the federal government, let's say it's at $500, uh, and under the American Rescue Plan, that could go down to $100. So that means that um, their premium they would be paying would be reduced by $400. That's just an example. Or it could go down to as much as near zero. The, the, um, the affordability for all Connecticut residents who are currently in the exchange have um, increased dramatically because of the American Rescue Plan. So we are encouraging all of our customers go on the exchange starting this Saturday, accesshealthct.com, or call, our, or call our call center, which will be open this Saturday from 9 to 3 at 855-805-4325. We, uh, the American Rescue Plan, we are still working the numbers but the clearly indicates that most of our customers, if not all of them, will save uh, um, over hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on a monthly basis in terms of um, premium reduction. So it would be in our best interest to make sure every Connecticut resident who are currently uninsured or underinsured go to the exchange to find out exactly how much can they be saving starting um, this Saturday. So I hope I've answered your question. The top side is you could reduce your monthly costs not talking to us starting this Saturday. Right. And Mr. Governor, you said with immunization, interest declining, what was that number again and over what span? I think we're down about 50% over the last uh, couple of weeks. Isn't that uh, about right, Josh? Exactly right. Thanks. Hey, um, since you were asking about ACA and the folks who can, um, you know, uh, go to accesshealthct.com or make that call, um, Damaris Velez, uh, you're a navigator. You're on the front line. You're taking questions from people. Who is not insured? Why aren't they getting insured? What are the barriers? Thank you, Governor. Uh, one of the biggest barriers that I personally see is is price, is for the families who um, normally make a, a, norm, a really um, comfortable living yearly and then COVID pandemic hit, and they really are struggling with the prices, the high prices of healthcare overall. So I think the American Rescue Plan is really going to make everything more, healthcare more affordable for all the residents of Connecticut. You know, over half the current customers will pay less than $16 a month. Are are there a lot of the people who are uninsured, would they fall into this category? I see a lot of families that 
aren't eligible for any tax credits. So having that cap lifted is really going to help a whole new group of families that maybe are not insured or don't insure the entire family. I People struggle with it. It's expensive. So I'm only going to insure my kids because they're more important or my spouse has issue health issues. So I'll insure my spouse and not myself. And I think this is really going to open it up to be able to insure whole families. Thank you. That's very helpful. Max. Thank you. The Associated Press. Uh, thanks, Max. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Governor, there continue to be uh, small numbers of cases in nursing homes, one here, two there. Are these being traced back to unvaccinated staff, to new admissions? Uh, what are we seeing? Josh, you want that one? Yeah, uh, thank you, Sue, for the question. It's, so it's a mix. Um, there, there are still some... Um, uh, unvaccinated uh, individuals out there, particularly in, in the senior population, although the number's gotten very small. So uh, DPH has uh, partnered with our providers and our hospitals to make sure uh, people getting discharged from hospitals to nursing homes get vaccinated on the way out to try to reduce that. Um, but there are still some unvaccinated people. There are occasionally vaccine breakthrough cases, particularly for people who are older with weaker immune systems. Um, those do happen from time to time, but they're very, very rare. Fortunately, as you can see, the nursing home numbers continue to be very small, very rare um, now to see cases uh, in our nursing homes, thankfully. I know I've asked this before and it's tough for you to say, but do you have any idea now like what percentage of nursing home workers are vaccinated? And I know that the turnover for residents is about 5%. What is it for the workers? Um, last time I saw the data, we were around 70% of uh, nursing home staff uh, had been vaccinated. And I don't know what the turnover of staff is. But we can try to get you an answer on that soon. Okay. And are there preparations being made for the possibility of kids under 16 getting vaccinated? And what have you guys heard about that, the possibility of that even happening anytime soon? You know, we're, we're eagerly awaiting FDA review of the data that Pfizer had submitted several weeks ago um, uh, associated with their clinical trial of adolescents aged 12 to 15. Um, so we, I don't believe they've scheduled a date to review that yet. We're not sure why, but hopefully that happens very soon. Uh, in particular, we'd like to see it happen before our providers uh, start to take down their mass vaccination sites um, so that we can get those 12 to 15 year olds through very quickly. Um, it's clear that we'll have adequate vaccine supply to move them through very quickly once the FDA approval comes. Uh, so we're hoping that that happens sooner rather than later. And you just made me think of one more. I'm sorry. What 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 is the time frame for taking down the mass vaccination sites? There there is no time frame. I think it'll just be based on demand. Uh, you know, certainly our providers have been doing a fantastic job of scaling their capacity up and now starting to ease it off as, as demand starts to wane. And frankly, as, as more and more of the remaining challenge uh, and opportunity to get people vaccinated will happen on a smaller basis at the mobile clinics, at pharmacies, at parades, at other gathering places, as opposed to the, the large scale mass vaccination sites. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The Day of New London. Governor, I wanted to ask a bit about uh, vaccines among vaccines and, and COVID cases among younger people. I know, you know, we had seen a little while back that, that, that there has been an issue ongoing of, of cases um, uh, rising in younger people. What's kind of the, the latest on that with, with um, young, young adults, uh, the, you know, 20s, 30s? Uh, yeah, since that's the group that's least likely to be vaccinated, uh, you're right. That's where we've seen most of the uh, COVID-related infections. I think very few complications, thankfully, although uh, there are more in the hospitals than there certainly were uh, six, nine months ago. But if you look at Brazil and India, where you have the most severe flare-ups internationally, uh, young people are, um, with a different variant, by the way, young people are getting infected and suffering some complications. And then you had showed that chart showing um, that the, the demand is, is kind of tailing off at a lower rate for, uh, you know, the, the youngest eligible age, age group than, than demand was tail, tailing off for um, the, the older um, age group. So what, what are you or what are DPH doing to specifically target, you know, the youngest eligible people uh, to, to get them vaccinated? You might that put that back up there, Max. Um, no, as you know, um, uh, 
the younger people, that 16 to 44 year old, you know, that is flattening out. We, I used to like to flatten the curve. That's not a curve I want to see flattening out. That's an age group we're really targeting. That's part of the, um, the incentive program. That's part of the Drinks on Us program out there. So, you know, we did a little bit for the high school kids in terms of giving them some time off, the Ferris Bueller incentives. So, um, and we're going to think about how we expand those incentives more broadly when it go into uh, big events like sports contests and, um, and concerts. Um, maybe there'll be some uh, preferred seating or maybe there'll be an accelerated line you can get through and that'll help incent people to get vaccinated. And then lastly, you had said uh, that uh, the indoor mask mandate will probably keep going a little bit longer. Do you have an idea kind of roughly of how long you're going to keep the indoor mask mandate and also what metrics or how would you even go about deciding when, when to get rid of that? Uh, I, I just talked to the restaurants and the stores and, um, you know, some of the health people we talked to. Basically, I think the stores and the restaurant folks have told me, unless you hear differently, um, rather than have us have to decide uh, when the mask is required and when's not, indoors, I think our customers still feel more comfortable when they see others wearing the mask. Uh, Governor, you, we take the heat and make it a, um, a requirement a little bit longer. But I'll follow their lead on this as well. The Waterbury Republican American. Oh, thanks, Max. Um, just a real quick question. On, um, I just saw the uh, number of towns on the highest uh, alert status uh, seemed to drop down to uh, below 100 for the first time, I think, in months. Is that, uh, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, well, the, the, as the governor mentioned earlier, the average daily number of cases we're seeing in Connecticut has dropped by almost 50% in the last two weeks. So, yes, we're, we're mm -hmm. the color drain out of that map, um, thankfully. Okay. And uh, I also, uh, to just follow up also on the Naugatuck Valley hotspot, it looks like there's been some significant decreases in there. I think like three weeks ago or so, Waterbury was 69 out of 100,000. Now it's down to 42. Uh, Seymour was 55. Now it's down to 22. Naugatuck 53 to 26. So, what uh, what are we seeing in the Naugatuck Valley? Obviously, there, there looks like there's an improvement there in terms of the uh, uh, case count. Jack, sure. Well, the you know the vaccination rates are starting to tick up there as well, although they're still you know relatively lower. Um, so we're really hopeful that more people will continue to get vaccinated in the valley. Um, you know, we're seeing general decrease in transmission though across the state and across the region. So, uh, you know, when that happens, you know, where we are a small state, uh, you know, you enjoy the benefits of that uh, across the board, but you also take the risks when it's going in the other direction, which is why it's so important that everyone who hasn't yet been vaccinated, um, you know, get that opportunity and, and take, that chance, take that shot as soon as possible. And I, I know that they're a week old, but I was looking at some of the stats and it looks like there's been about a 20% decline in weekly vaccinations from uh, the April 10th to the 17th. And I'm just wondering, you know, how, do, you know, is that a result of the J&J &J pause, uptake, hesitancy among the remaining unvaccinated populations? What's, so what are the reasons behind that? I think the older populations who are the ones most eager to get vaccinated, older meaning, um, you know, 50 and above, are overwhelmingly vaccinated, lined up, wanted to get vaccinated. Younger folks, you know, 16 to 44, like we were saying, Paul, early on, um, we got, um, you know, 40 percent plus of them vaccinated. But now it's a little more work to get the so-called invincibles vaccinated. And uh, Josh, do we have any information on the uh, the, the goal of uh, regarding the postal code, uh, the, the selected uh, postal code, excuse me, the uh, selected postal codes and the vaccination goals? Yes, the vaccination rates amongst our high SBI um, zip codes. So it, it ticked up another percentage point this week. So continuing some steady progress there, but still more work to do. All right, and just the, the final question for me, the, the, it looks like uh, the, the variants are, are continuing to, to grow here. I just think in the, in the last month, my math is right. It's gone from about 2,500 at the start to about 4,200, a little more now. Uh, the B117 looks like it's... Uh, maybe tripled. Um, what does it say about the spread of variants? Well, 
I think as, as a lot of the public health experts have predicted, you know, the B117 in particular has become the, you know, the dominant strain, but, you know, in the context of a rapidly declining, you know, total number of cases in the state. And most importantly, you know, all the data continues to show that the vaccines are highly effective against all of these variants. So uh, to sound like a broken record, it's just another reason to go get vaccinated um, because uh, you'll get strong protection against all the variants. Okay, thank you very much. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Thanks. Um, Mr. Michelle, um, how many people are enrolled in Access Health right now, and how many more do you anticipate with this new rollout, please? Right now, we have a little bit over 105,000 Connecticut residents enrolled through Access Health. And we also, um, it's hard to predict exactly how many more are going to um, come in as a result of the American Rescue Plan or special enrollment that, we, that we're going to start this Saturday. But uh, the numbers that I said, stated earlier today, roughly 200,000 Connecticut residents are still uninsured. And we have about 10,000 10, uh, who are insured, but they're insured off exchange. And they have the potential to come on the exchange and benefit from the enhanced um, subsidies as a result of the American Rescue Plan. So we're anticipating uh, at least 210,000 or more individuals uh, uh, could potentially benefit from Access Health. Uh, so we have a marketing and outreach effort that, we, uh, that we're going to start um, on Monday that will target specific communities that we know where, where the uninsured are to get them in and working with our, with our partners, uh, Project Access, where the Marist work to get those, uh, get those folks in, in, into the front door and uh, get them access as quickly as possible. Again, uh, as the governor has indicated, as Laura indicated, this, um, for the next two years, uh, we will have the most affordable health insurance in, in the history of Connecticut. Um, thanks. Josh, um, how many doses um, did Connecticut get this week, and what do you anticipate next week? Um, well, our, our uh, direct allocation, state allocation, is a little over 100,000 uh, this week. But as the governor mentioned, you know, we don't have demand at this point in the state for the full amount, and our providers ordered about half of that. Uh, okay, Next week, thanks. we'll continue to be about the same, perhaps grow a little bit. But, you know, nationwide now, we're in a position where, you know, we have more supply than, than demand. Thanks. Um, governor, you were talking about your instinct on the, the mask mandate. What's your instinct about the impact of, of kids in restaurants uh, inside and uh, looking, looking after May 1st and uh, May 19th? Um, I think that, um, you know, again, young people outside, I, I think that's going to be fine um, as long as they know who they're with. I think inside they will be wearing the mask a little bit longer, um, much less likely to suffer complications, as we know, Ken, but they can still get infected and infect others. I might say that also before, you know, April 20th, the legislature um, may weigh in as well with a point of view on this. Thanks. Thank you. The Hartford Current. Hi, um, I wanted to follow up on uh, Sue's questions about vaccination for uh, children, for teenagers. Um, when that is eventually approved, will it be like hit the ground running the ne next day you can show up and get a, a vaccination or is there some sort of preparation that will be required on the ground to make that happen? Uh, well, I'll start with that. I mean, um, I think uh, the Pfizer is being tested right now. Uh, Dr. Fauci told us he thought we might get some sort of a green light um, on uh, at least for a younger age group, maybe not the youngest, but a younger age group by uh, the end of July, August. It will certainly require a parent's permission and um, I, hopefully we can roll it out through existing channels. So it, it would be like, I mean, if you show up with your parent the day after the FDA approval, will somebody give you a vaccine? Yeah, Alex, we should be, we should be ready to go straight away. Got it. And then one more that is maybe a little bit in the weeds, but um, people have noticed certain patterns in the um, COVID data, like on Tuesday, the positivity rate seems to be a little higher. On Thursday, maybe it seems to be a little lower. I'm wondering, is there any reason for that? Is that all in people's imagination? Or, or what do you have for me, Josh? <laughs> 
So yeah, uh, th that's true. The, the Tuesday phenomenon in the data is is real. I think it, it ties back to a couple factors. So the, the data that's being reported on Tuesday is uh, test data in particular is mostly comprised of uh, results that are reported to the Department of Public Health on Monday, right? They get aggregated and reported on Tuesday. So those results are often from samples that are collected on Sunday. Um, and Sunday, of course, is a weekend. There's not a lot of asymptomatic screening going on. Probably the only people going out to get tested are people who have symptoms or you know have uh, close contact, probably a, overall a higher risk profile. So it's not surprising that we often see a higher positivity rate on Tuesday. And then with regards to hospitalizations, you know, again, backing up the same way, a lot of what you see there is weekend dynamics where, you know, that may be a little more challenging to discharge uh, patients to nursing homes or other facilities that may not have, you know, as robust staffing on a weekend. So that may have to wait till Monday and then, you know, get picked up the following day's data. So there are, there are some, it's kind of like a, a follow through on the weekend um, is what, what you end up seeing on Tuesday often. All right, I'm glad we got to the bottom of that. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> the Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. Um, had a quick question on the J&J. &J. Um, I know there were two J&J &J only clinics earlier this week um, where about 32 people were vaccinated at one and 45 at another. Um, are you monitoring who's using it and have, have there been other clinics that I'm not aware of? Um, and those numbers are meh, kind of meh. What's the, what's the sense on how we're doing on the, on the, you know, the reuse of the J&J &J and a... Yeah, Josh. Well, the, the number of J&J &J vaccinations that have been reported at DPH, it's been increasing each day since the pause was lifted. Yesterday, there was over 500 vaccinations of J&J. And then we know, I think Hartford Healthcare and Yale, New Haven are going to do um, J and J clinics at some of their mass vaccination sites in the coming days. So uh, we'll see. I, I th think it, you know, it, it will let demand uh, drive, you know, the, the the how that J and J continues to be rolled out. Uh, we know a number of the smaller independent pharmacies have been offering J and J. We heard one instance where they had a real surge of demand there. Um, so we're hopeful that you know that we'll continue to see strong demand for J and J going forward. Uh, a question that I, um, while you were answering Sue's, um, people that are dis, um, discharged from the hospital and sent to nursing homes, um, I know, for example, Hartford Hospital is, vac is vaccinating all of them. Are all the hospitals, are, are, is DPH requiring all patients being discharged from a hospital to a nursing home to be vaccinated before they go? They have asked uh, hospitals to do that, and I, I believe all of them are at least in process of, of uh, setting up that protocol. Okay, and one last, uh, you mentioned the SBI index had increased uh, by 1%. Um, if I heard that right, that's, a, so we're, that's about what we've seen the last couple of weeks, right? 1%, 1%, 1%. Um, uh, uh, are we slogging ahead there, or what's your sense overall on on how we're doing trying to get at the 50 SBI zip codes? Uh, yeah, I mean, steady progress. You know, we're, we're up to 27% against the 31% target right now. Um, so the gap is narrowing. We're, we're seeing that, too, in the racial and ethnic uh, breakdown of, of vaccination rates where, you know, we are starting to close those gaps, particularly in the older age groups. Um, so steady progress. We'd like to see those gaps close faster, um, but we, you know, our providers and partners are, are working very hard to provide as easy access as we can in, in those communities that are still behind. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. Question about uh, the change in health insurance becoming more affordable. So if a resident is signed up for, say, the state's silver or gold plan through Access Health CT, they should call Saturday to see if their rate is going to change and, and it can become more affordable? Absolutely. The, the rate is not going to change. What's going to change is the subsidy that they, that they currently receive or not be receiving from the federal government. And, uh, we have about 25% of our customers receive no subsidy at all because of the cap. The cap is now removed. So that population is um, potentially 
could save a, uh, a monthly amount in the thousands of dollars. Uh, again, now we've done some some sampling. Uh, a family of four, as the governor indicated, uh, who made one hundred six thousand dollars. Currently, uh, they are paying about thirty three hundred dollars a month for health insurance, and uh, because uh, they didn't quite, they don't currently do not qualify because of, they over their four hundred percent of of federal poverty level. Uh, with that being removed, uh, that family, if they don't do anything at all, come in and stay in the same plan, they will save about $3,200 a month. And this will be going forward. They won't receive any back pay, right, from previous months? Uh, uh, can you repeat the question? I mean, back pay in terms of will they recover any, um, any unused subsidy? As in, if they were paying a big rate last month when they call Saturday, they're not going to be um, given money back for what they will continue to pay from May on? No, they, they, they will not there, but the, the, again, the premium will be reduced. However, uh, because this is starting in uh, June and July, the, uh, the, the uh, reduction in rates, the subsidies uh, is from, July, from January 1, 2021 going through December 30, 31, uh, 2022. Uh, so they will be they will be able to recover their first six months of subsidies when they when, uh, when they file the tax returns next year for 2021. Okay, and question for Josh. I know um, when Sue asked about uh, timeline for these mass vaccination sites and uh, mass testing sites, that there is no definitive date when you're going to be rolling back. But I, I guess in June, do you picture these? Uh, these mass vaccination sites still being there, or by June, do people going to their local doctor's offices or clinics to get vaccinated? You know, it, it'll depend a little bit, as we discussed previously, on whether new populations are becoming um, uh, eligible to be vaccinated, like adolescents, for example. But uh, most likely, I think we'll see a lot fewer mass vaccination sites by the time we get to June. And, and like you pointed out, uh, many more uh, opportunities to get vaccinated at your doctor's office, at your pharmacy, um, you know, at other large events where our mobile units will be uh, out and about. Thank you. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, I had a quick um, clarification for Mr. Mitchell there. Um, it, if I'm an existing customer on Access Health and, I, and let's say I don't know about this change at all and I take no action, um, will this be the kind of thing that I, I get these savings anyways due to some automatic process, um, even if I'm not aware of it? Um, yes. The, um, starting in June, uh, starting this Saturday, if you want to take advantage of it, you have to call our call center or go online and update your information. Then it'll, have, it'll kick in and uh, your, your June invoice from your insurance carrier will reflect the change. However, uh, we are currently working on our system, so we will automatically update our current customers who qualify, who qualify uh, to update down their records uh, so that the July invoice they get from the insurance carrier will reflect the, uh, the, the new amount, which will account for the, uh, the enhanced or increased subsidy. So that will happen automatically. However, uh, let me stress that we are going to have a very aggressive uh, statewide marketing campaign. So it'll be hard for anyone in Connecticut not to, not, not to know of the benefit for themselves and their families because we are going to be very aggressive in our marketing this, uh, this huge benefit for our customers and also for Connecticut res residents, the residents who currently do, do not have in, um, insurance, health insurance or underinsured. Okay, thank you. Uh, Governor, as we open... Um our move to open bars and lift restrictions on res our restaurants this weekend. I wonder if you have any opinion on the state capitol building, when that should be open to the public, recognizing that I think legislative management makes that call. Uh, you're right. Legislative management makes that call. So I probably will um, stay out of that. Um, I know people are eager to get back, and if everybody is vaccinated, they'll get back even sooner. Okay, one last thing. Um, obviously, you signed the exemption to the school vaccine bill yesterday. Uh, opponents have been saying that they plan to challenge that in court. Uh, 
anticipating that that'll be a story in the near future. Do you think that that's a new that new law will withstand court scrutiny? Oh boy, I don't know that, but um, everybody likes to sue. It just seems to me we've spent um, the last four months talking about how safe and effective vaccines are. They're breaking the back of COVID, allowing us to get back to a new normal. So. I'd like to think we can put this issue behind us. I'm trying to do everything I can to encourage people to get vaccinated in time for the new school year. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm getting the signal here. Uh, just to follow up on that, he was questioned. I mean, Saturday's gonna be a pretty good day. Saturday's a good day because you can um, sit outside with friends um, and hopefully you've been vaccinated, not have to wear a mask, have a lemonade or something, a little more juice. And, uh, and we're getting back to our new normal. Saturday's a good day because as James and Damaris and then Laura pointed out, the cost of your um, health insurance on the exchange is gonna go down dramatically for um, the overwhelming majority of you. you know, take advantage of that. Um, take advantage of accesshealthct.com. Uh, make the call at 855-805-4325. Uh, you'll save yourself some money and pass the word to any friend you have that is not, um, you know, so insured. We had a little debate about what should be the uh, final um, slide. Um, uh, Food and Wine magazine came out with their ratings uh, for what states had the very best pizza. I know we've had a little bit of pizza wars uh, around the region over the last uh, number of months. Um, we weren't perfect. New Jersey beat us out, gosh darn it, but we were number two, so we beat out another 48 states as for the best uh, pizza in the country. So um, take that, New York. And, um, but this is more historic. Um, look at this picture. Leaving whatever your thoughts are on policies, um, there's a 78-year-old president of the United States, um, two women standing behind him, um, one is Speaker of the House, and the other um, is Vice President of the United States, a woman of Indian and African American background. Uh, progress is never even, but progress is still progress. Thanks, everybody.